last time I got the impression people left this room more confused than I would like. So I'm going to review the first part a little bit, go back over it just slightly, then move on. And sometimes it's just using this stuff and working with it that makes it become clear. I'm hoping, for instance, heteroscedasticity is a lot clearer in your minds now than it was at one point in time. You felt similar confusion, and it's been cleared up, I hope. If not, that, that's not a very good analogy, but I'm, I'm hoping that's the case. So let's go back over what the heck we're trying to do here. So we're looking at one of the violations of the assumptions needed to guarantee that estimators are best linear unbiased estimators to guarantee that they are blue. We call these assumptions C6 and C7, but whatever C, whatever they are, B, A, there's different numbers in the book. The assumptions we're worried about are that the errors are uncorrelated and that the errors are correlated with the x's. So there's two different assumptions that get violated. We're going to have first correlated errors. So with time series, there are two problems up here. The first is you have correlation among the errors. And that's a problem. So the correlation of ut, us, does not equal 0, or t not equal to s. So if your errors are correlated, that violates one of the assumptions. And in general, you're going to lose efficiency in this particular case. But we'll be more specific about that. The other violation is correlation of the right-hand side variables with the error terms. This is usually an efficiency problem. This is usually a bias slash inconsistency problem. Okay, I think we got that far okay. Then I try to use three models to illustrate these two problems. And in one of those models in particular, I think that I didn't do the best possible job of explaining why there's a problem. So I want to go back over that material again, realizing that I, I could have done this better. So these are the two things. They don't necessarily happen together. But usually one of them occurs with time series data, with autocorrelation. So this is, auto, this is what we mean by autocorrelation. When your errors are autocorrelated, this happens. And sometimes this happens too. So this is usually a quick, but you can get this without this too. So these can appear alone, they can appear together. So I wanted to look at some examples where we had one problem, we had the other problem, or we had both problems. So we looked at three different examples last time to try to illustrate the breakdown of these two problems. And the basic model we're going to use is that yt is beta 1 plus beta 2 x 2t plus ut, where ut is rho ut minus 1 plus et. So this shows the correlation. So this violates the first, this is the first problem here. This is the first problem right here. So that's going to violate the correlation. So we've got correlated errors. In fact, rho is the correlation. Rho squared is like r squared. That's what it is. You square rho, you get r squared in that regression. So that's what it is. It shows how correlated the two things are. OK, when this happens, you have a loss of efficiency but it's unbiased and consistent. So that's what we're trying to say here. This is just a, a, an efficiency problem here. And that's the problem that we have here, just an efficiency problem. Okay. People are writing. Give you a chance. Okay. 
dead air time, but that's okay. Then we looked at yt is beta 1 plus beta 2, yt minus 1 plus ut. And ut is not correlated. So we don't have this in this case. This is, the problem is here. I haven't said what the problem is yet. The problem is here. But unbiased, consistent, shows correlation, UT not correlated. I'm trying to figure out which one you can't read. <laughs> Usually a bias and consistency problem. You clearly can't read one of them. I'm not picking up this. Not tuning in on the right radio frequency. Um, Okay, so what is the problem here? Well, in this case, this is not the problem. This is okay. We're not correlate. This is the problem. So we wrote out that um, uh, go up here. Just stay working over here. So we wrote out that you can write beta two hat. Just call this x2t, where x2t is at. And I'm going to write this in terms of x's for the moment. So we say, well, beta 2 hat is the true beta plus the sum of the xt minus x bar times the ut's over the sum of the xt minus x bar squared. From one. Is that how we let me make sure I got the same notation we're using? Is that is that the way we wrote it last time? Yeah, it's sitting there. Sorry. Okay. That's the same notation. And then we, we made that one thing AT, right? So now we're going to make, um, sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah, exactly right. Okay. And then we called this part of this. AT. So we said, well, this is beta 2 plus the sum of the AT UTs. So what we need for this to be unbiased, we take the expected value, we need that this, we need the expected value to be zero. But if these are correlated, it won't be zero. So when the, when the U is correlated with any X, see, see A has, AT has every X in it. AT doesn't have, I, I did this wrong, the sum is outside this. So AT is this part, that's my fault. So AT is XT minus X bar over the sum of the XT minus X bar squared. All, we, all I want from this is that AT depends upon all of the X's. Every single one of the X's is in AT. It's not just today. If this is T, this is T. So today's X is in there. But yesterday's X is in there. Tomorrow's X is in there. All the X's are in there. That's the critical point that you have to see here. So in order for this expectation to be zero, we need that ut is independent of not just the current x, but every x. So ut has to be unrelated to every x. xt plus 1, xt plus 2, xt minus 1, all of them. Okay? So what's the problem in this model? So this is x2t. I'm calling it yt minus 1, but it's just xt. 
I need that ut is independent of every y. Well, we already know it's not independent of this one. But let's just show you something. What's yt plus 1? It's beta 1 plus beta 2 yt plus ut plus 1, right? Is that right? And, and will you agree that ut is in here? So here's yt, and it has ut in it, doesn't it? So one of the x's is correlated with, with one of the u's. yt is correlated with ut. So this is not independent of all of our x's. This is not independent of yt, which is one of the x's here. Now in this case, it's not a problem that yt is correlated with ut. So it's not correlated with the current ut. yt minus 1 is correlated with ut minus 1. It's the other error. So it's, it's not a contemporaneous correlation. It's the fact that yt plus what we would call xt plus 1 here, which would be yt. xt plus 1 is correlated with ut. So one of the x's is correlated with u, but it's not the current x. It's tomorrow's x. So that's what we're trying to point out is the critical thing here. I'm going to help you raise this. So you have this xt vector, x, 1t, or x, sorry, x, 2, 1, down to x, 2t. So this is just your spreadsheet data right here. So that's your first observation on x, which is y t minus 1. This is y 0. And this is y cap t minus 1 in the actual data. I'm using this notation over there, but it's actually equal to that. Then we said there's this u t. And somewhere in here, there's an x t. There's an x t plus 1. And there's an x t minus 1. Two t I should have twos in front of those. Okay, let me just stop. Are you follow? Are you tracking me here? So, you know, about 85% of the heads are nodding yes. The rest of you I need help from. You'll have to ask a question because I can't know what you're confused about. So please. Yes. Uh, I have a question about the yt minus 1. Mm -hmm. Is the yt minus 1 equal to x2t? We would normally write this as x2t. Uh -huh. And so in this case, I'm just saying that think, think of this as x2t for intu intuition, but the variable is actually yt minus 1. Then what's different between the first case and the second case? Okay. In the first case, x2t was not a random variable. It was chosen by the experimenter, and I meant to say that. And so xt is not random. It's fixed in repeated samples. It's chosen. And so there's no way that ut can be correlated with xt because it's not a random variable. Okay. Now we've gone and allowed for, which is really why the book went from b assumptions to c assumptions. The critical thing that happens in an earlier chapter and suddenly the x's become random instead of non-random. So this is a non-random x, which means it, it, it has shocks in it. It has randomness in it. And the question is whether the randomness in here is correlated with the randomness in here. If it is, you have a problem. If it's not, you don't have a problem, because then it's just like the first model. Even though it's random, as long as it's uncorrelated with the error term, you're just fine. So the fact that this is why t makes it random, the randomness introduces the possibility that it's correlated with the error term. And now we're trying to examine the problem in more detail to see if that correlation is actually there. But if you have non-random x's, you can't have a correlation because you need, 
it, it relies upon two random variables being correlated. That's what you're looking at. And so when the x's are simply fixed by the experimenter, we have no problem. So in the first model, we had yt is beta 1 plus beta 2 x 2t plus ut, and ut is rho ut minus 1 plus et. Those things are simply not correlated. So that's not the problem. It's not the second problem because these are fixed. This is the problem here. Then I said, okay, let's take away this problem and make this yt minus 1. I don't have this problem anymore. Now I have another problem because this is now random and correlated with this. Then the next point was it's not actually yt minus 1 that's correlated with ut. It's what we call xt plus 1, or yt, that's correlated with ut. So the correlation in this model is between this variable and ut. It's not between x2. This is, this is yt minus 1. This is yt. This is yt minus 2. I'm calling it x so you can get the timing right. Because this has a t minus 1 in it. And when I call this, last time I kept calling this contemporaneous variable, and I got the sense that people didn't realize that this is the time t variable because it has a t minus 1 on it. So I'm trying to make clear that this is the variable at time t. It's, it's, it's with x2, t, and, and ut that are correlated, we have huge problems. When it's x2, t plus 1 and ut that are correlated, it's not so bad. So where I'm trying to head with this is that as long as ut is correlated outside of the contemporaneous correlation, it's not a big problem. It's when ut is correlated with the current x, with this yt minus 1, that we have a problem. That was an awfully long answer, and it looks like I lost you along the way. So, um, I don't know what to say. <coughs> So we're trying to distinguish now two cases. One where ut is correlated with x2t, that's going to cause all kinds of problems. And one where ut is correlated with everything but the current one, that causes bias but we're consistent. That doesn't cause very big problems. This is one of the cases where we don't have a very big problem. This is not correlated with this. This already happened. This is a new roll of the dice. They can't be correlated. This, this is already known when this happens, so they, they just can't be correlated. Yt minus 1 and ut are not correlated. But yt and ut are, because yt has ut in it. But yt is xt plus 1. And so we have a correlation between these two variables, between yt and ut. Let me, let me start over. So we have x21 down to x2t. This is really y0 to yt minus 1. Somewhere in here there's x2t, which is really yt minus 1. This is the variable we're using. But that, that's what it actually is in the regression. It's a time the variable. Then we've got this, this ut thing. If there's correlation here, that's a big problem. So when the correlation is contemporaneous, and it's not in this case, but when it is, that's a big problem. When the correlation does not involve ut, as in here, it's not a big problem. So this is not a big problem. This is the big problem. Ah. I'm going to say not here. Yeah. Sorry. Dang it. 
No, I did it right. Jeez. Sorry. <laughs> this is the one that's wrong. So, if the kid correlation is contemporaneous, it's a big problem. If it's not, it's not a big problem. Doesn't that say the correlation doesn't involve x2t, because all the correlations involve uv? If, if x2t is uninvolved, then you're OK. Yeah, so you wrote when the correlation doesn't involve uv. Right, so, oh, I meant x. Boy. Okay, okay. The contemporaneous x. I mean, it, it doesn't involve the current x. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Did I do it wrong again? No. I was, uh, so if the error term is correlated with today, like today's error is correlated with today's x, that's about that's a problem. Yes. And if it there, today's error is correlated with yesterday's or tomorrow's. Okay, that's not. A that's not a big problem. What's the difference between a lowercase t? Uh, big T is like big N, so that's the, big T is like by 100 observations, this is 100, and this is just a placeholder. So big T is like big N. It's telling us how many observations there are. The test is in one week. I meant to talk about this at the beginning. It will cover through autocorrelation. We'll get farther than that on Tuesday, much farther, but we won't go past chapter 12 for the exam. So I've got two days to get this done. I'd rather get it right than hurry through it. Okay, let's start again. So we had model one, yt is beta one plus beta two x two t plus ut, ut was rho, ut minus one plus ut. This was unbiased, consistent, but inefficient. So this was <laughs> unbiased, consistent, but inefficient. So what do we have in this case? Because the correlation is not contemporaneous, because the correlation is outside the current, it's not that and that, it's some other y. So the way you'd figure it out, you just write your model down. If it's this and this then correlated, that's a problem. If it's some other time index, that's not a big problem. So it's just a matter of whether this time index whether what's here is this correlated with here. If it's some other time period, then you're OK. So in this case, we have um, it's biased. So that introduces bias. It's thought to be small. So we mostly ignore it. So it's usually ignored. Particularly since it's consistent. If we have a large number of observations, we know that we're converging to the true value as n goes to infinity. Remember, this is for a fixed sample size. This is just the expected value of the estimator for, say, n t equals 100. This is what happens as t goes to infinity, as your sample goes to infinity. So for a fixed sample size, we have bias. But if, if n is fairly big, because it's consistent, we're, we're convinced that bias is generally pretty small. So quite honestly, we ignore this problem. Okay? We, we, they're consistent, that's good enough. We make sure n's big, and then we ignore the problem. Now, here's the third model. It's exactly like the second model. But now I'm going to make the... I'm going to make this correlated with this this time contemporaneously. And the way I do that is I make, this has ut minus 1, is it, doesn't it? 
If I write down y t minus 1, what's the error going to be? u t minus 1. So y t is a bunch of stuff plus u t. u t minus 1 is in y t minus 1. Has to be. That's how you construct y t minus 1. So u t minus 1 is in there. So if I could put u t minus 1 in here, they're going to be correlated contemporaneously. So if we make u t is rho u t minus 1 plus e t, now that's correlated with that. Now I have a huge problem because I have contemporaneous correlation between the right-hand side variables and the errors. See, y t minus 1 has u t minus 1 in it, so y t minus 1 is correlated with that. So that's going to make this and this correlated contemporaneously. I don't have to go to y t this time to get a correlation. It's the existing x that's the problem. In this case, it's biased, inconsistent, and inefficient, which is why I say there's big problems. This one we need to fix. This one we let go. This one we'll fix just to make it more efficient. So we usually fix this one to make it more efficient. This one's not a big problem. We usually let it go. And this one we need to fix. This one's actually correlated outside contemporary. This one's correlated here, but yt is also correlated there. So you've got not only contemporaneous correlation, but correlation outside the contemporaneous time period. But it's a contemporaneous one, the time t one, that we're worried about. So that, this, one's, this one's a big problem. So this is what I thought, and I, I don't know if y'all got it now, but this is, I didn't think we had this at all last time when we walked down the road. Just some, some, uh, some number that you estimate. And the reason that it's inefficient and biased is because the ut minus 1 is also a part of the, uh, or the inefficiency, the intuition for it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, as I said, yt depends on, the very, or depends on the error term of the time before, correct? Yeah. So what's happening is that OLS assumes these are independent and that every one of them provides the same amount of information and so it thinks it's explaining a whole bunch of stuff so it's really happy and it gives you small standard errors but really when you think about it the new error has already been explained it's not explaining new stuff at all this is the only new part when the, this is yesterday's error say this is 0.9 today's error is 0.9 of yesterday's plus of this and if this Variance is fairly small. There's a lot of persistence in here. So this is not a new observation. You mostly already know about it. OLS thinks, oh, I, this is brand new stuff. I need to react to it. Oh, and I fit it really well. Aren't I smart? Well, that's because they fit it well yesterday. It's not a new observation. What's some, like, can you give an example of something that might be biased like this? Uh, have this kind of an air term? Uh, yeah, like have this type of error. Um, uh, GDP. So that when you're a, so you you estimate. So last <coughs> night on my CBS blog, I posted um, real investment, and then they estimated a trend, a trend line. So there's I star. That's the trend, and then the actual series fluctuates around that trend. So these are the errors in that model. And these errors are highly correlated. If I'm away from trend today, I'm likely to be away from trend tomorrow. And so knowledge of ut minus 1 tells me a lot about ut. So the errors are correlated over time. And so the t-statistic for this thing was like, you know, 200 or some, some day thing. Because it was totally biased. Because OLS thinks, oh, I'm doing so wonderful <laughs> fitting these observations. But it's really not. And so this model looks like it fit well, but it doesn't because you're not accounting for the serial correlation in the errors. So you get misled in this model. One of the things we, I forgot, we said last time was what you get here is your T's are too big and your F's are too big. So you think things are highly significant when they're really not. You get really low. The inefficiency expresses itself as really low standard errors. 
and it fools you into thinking you have wonderful fits when you don't. But since it's unbiased, there was really no reason for me to correct it. I got the unbiased acid of the trend, which is really all I was after. What I wanted to see was how far we are. We're about there. <laughs> That's 9091. The gap we have left is bigger than the total gap in 9091. Okay. Problem in, prob in uh, example one is C6. You have correlated errors, you get inefficiency. The problem here is C7. X's are correlated with the errors. The problem here is C6 and C7. Not only are the x's correlated with the errors, but the errors themselves are correlated. So this is one problem, this is the other problem, this is both. number. I don't really care about the numbers, but I do care about the concepts. So I'd be fully comfortable writing down a model and asking if there's bias here or something like that. In what type? And yeah. But in terms of, is it C4 or C8? That's pretty arbitrary. There's no natural order. So the next thing we did was we said, okay, look, this is problematic. It looks like when we have this kind of a problem here, we need to do something about it. And so um, we need a test for this kind of a problem. And we came up with a test for that kind of a problem called the Durbin-Watson test. And so we looked at the Durbin-Watson statistic. We noted it's between 0 and 4. We explained why and explain that when you're near zero, that's indicative of really high correlation among your errors. So what you're doing is you're trying to estimate this row, essentially. When it's zero, that means when Thurman Watts is zero, it means rho is near one. So you have huge autocorrelation problems. When the Durbin Watts is two, that's zero, no problem. And the Durbin Watts is four, that's minus one, big problem again. <coughs> We're mostly interested in that zero to, to, to two range where you have positive correlation. So we went through the test for this, how to test for it. That was a Durbin-Watson test. That should have been relatively clear, so I don't think I want to go over that again unless there's questions. And let's move on then to um, the second test, which is much easier. Okay, so before I go on, how you doing? You, you, you with us? I mean, the answer is some are, some are, but hopefully we tilt it more one way than the other. Okay. So, sometimes the Durbin-Watson statistic comes out inconclusive, and more importantly, I suppose, is that the Durbin-Watson statistic is only diagnostic of first-order serial correlation. So last time I talked about different processes, we call this an AR1, an autoregressive first order process. So UT is rho, UT minus one plus ET is what we call an AR1. You can have an AR2, which is UT is rho one, UT minus one plus rho two, UT minus two plus ET. And you could also have an ARP. P 
key is almost always used to indicate the order of an autoregressive process. And that's ut is row 1 ut minus 1 plus row p ut minus p plus et. So this number just indicates how many lags of the error that you have. Now, let's suppose <coughs> that in your data you have seasonality. So that every December things boom or something like that. What that's going to look like in your error is this. Row UT, if it was quarterly data, will be a function of the UT minus 4. You'll see correlation at an annual level. The Durbin-Watson test will not pick this up. It only looks for this kind of serial correlation. It's testing for the first order term here. It would look at this and say, hey, there's no first order term. You're fine. You're not fine. You've got, you've got correlation among your errors. So we need a more general test. For first order, the Durbin Watson is what you should use. For higher order, like this or this, or when there's missing terms, when you don't have the UT minus one term in there, then you need to use a different kind of a test. So we've got a different test ready. So this is called the Bruce Godfrey, Godfrey LM test. And this is fairly intuitive. So let's say that yt is beta 1 plus beta 2 x 2t plus beta to the k as kt plus ut. And ut is row 1 ut minus 1 plus row p ut minus p plus et. So our null hypothesis is row 1 equals row 2 equals row p equals 0. The alternative is at least one non-zero. Because if all those are 0, ut is et. There's no problem. There's no serial correlation. We've just given it a new name. Gone to court and said ut is now et. It's still the same old UT. There's no... It's useful intuitively to plug that into there. So let's do that. So the basic model we want to work with here is uh, this. Yt is beta 1 plus beta 2 x 2t plus beta k x kt plus rho 1 ut minus 1 plus rho p ut minus p plus ut. So I just substituted ut in up here. That's all I did. So this part right here is ut. So just run the y on the x's, save the residual. So we're saving this thing, the whole residual.
And you can do this by LLS. Two. Estimate, regress the estimated error. The second thing you do is regress ut hat from there, estimated error, on all the x's at 2t x kt plus a constant 2. And the lags of this up to p, ut minus 1 to ut minus p. So you regress ut on all the x's and lags of the u's. Yesterday's u's, the day before, up to p days before. <coughs> now the number of observations is t minus p here. Because I can't get lags of errors beyond u1. When, I, when, when x is, when t is 1, this is u1. But what's u1 equal to? u1 is row 1, u0. This would be 1 minus p. We don't have, the, we don't have data past x equal, t equals 1. So we don't have the lagged errors. So we have to start at the p plus first observation so we can have p lags in the data. You with me? If I have ut and it's 1, minus 3, 4, minus 5, 6, 2, 1, what's ut minus 1? Well, there is no ut minus 1 here, so that, I don't have that one. This will be 1 minus 3, 4, minus 5, 6, and 2. The, the one before this is 2. The one before this is minus 5. The one before this is 4. The one before this doesn't exist. And so with one lag, we have to start our data at t equals 2. We lose one observation. If I have a second lag, I lose a second observation. So I have to start at t equals 3. So I lose p observations when I use, when I use lags in my data, because I just don't have them available to estimate. So the number of observations for this regression is t minus p. OK. 3, compute n minus p r squared. This is an, or t minus pr squared. I'm t now. Always before, this was n or tr squared, the number of observations times r squared, but we, we've lost p of them. So our test statistic, this is the LM statistic. That's distributed chi-square of p, where p is the number of restrictions, like always. So there's p restrictions in this regression. So that's just a chi-square test, just like always. So you just look up in the back of the book the critical value. If it's bigger, you reject. If it's smaller, you fail to reject. So this is just the same old nr squared test, tr squared test, lm test that we've been doing all along. So this is really easy. Run regression, save ut, run ut on all the x's, all the lags, and then uh, calculate t minus pr squared, compare it to the critical value, and go home. Well, this is not because of your sad faces. 
But I do have good news. I'm going to cut something out this year that I've always made everyone do in the past. It's really hard and tedious. It takes a long time in the lab. It takes me a long time in class. And that's something called the Cochrane Orcut Procedure. I'm going to explain it. I'm going to show it to you because there's intuition. It's useful to learn. It's still in the literature. People are still using it. But the Cochrane Orcut Procedure was built for a time when we did not have very powerful computers. Often you end up with nonlinear estimation problems. And in the old days, nonlinear estimation or maximum likelihood estimation was really, really hard. You just couldn't do it on a PC. And so what we came up with was all these fancy ways of estimating models with a series of linear OLS regressions that if you did it enough times in a row would converge to the nonlinear maximum likelihood estimator. And so we would find these iterative procedures that would converge to the nonlinear outcomes. You could just do a linear regression over and over and over, and maybe four or five, six times, it converged fairly quickly. It's like you know finding a square root of Gauss's Newton's method or something like that. It converges really fast no matter what your starting value is. But you know, we had to do these iterative things, and it was designed merely because we didn't have very powerful computers. The student version of eViews now does maximum likelihood estimation for AR1 and ARP models. We don't have to use Cochrane Orcut anymore. We can get a much more efficient, better estimator. So although I think there's learning and intuition to be gained from forcing you through this, you'll never use it. And so I decided it's time to get with the more modern times and not make you do it. And so we'll come up with an estimator that's a nonlinear estimator. We don't know how to do nonlinear estimation. So our solution in this case is sort of explain how you do the nonlinear estimate, you know, what model you're estimating. And then I'm going to tell you to push the right button on EVIAs. And it will do the nonlinear estimation for you. It's the same principle. You minimize as a, a sum of squared errors. But you have to use uh, approximations linear approximations and hill climbing techniques to sort of find the maximum in these functions. It's a little bit more complicated, so we won't go through it. So, we know how to, we know that serial correlation causes problems, two kinds of problems. Sometimes they appear together. We know how to test for it. Now, so how do you correct for it? Ah, uh, oh, shoot. So one other thing I forgot to do first. Shoot. Um, so let me cover this. For model three, when you have yt is beta one plus beta two x two t. I can have more x's, but let me just leave them out to make. Oh, and, and this is yt minus one plus ut, where ut is rho u t minus 1 plus e t. In this case, the Durbin-Watson statistic, which was the sum of the u t hat minus u t minus 1 hat squared over the sum <coughs> of the u t squareds, that Durbin-Watson statistic is biased. So it's, it's no good anymore. We have to use something else. The reason it's biased is because, well, why? Why is it biased? It must be the things inside it are biased. There's only one thing inside it, UT hat. The UT hat must be biased. Why is UT hat biased? Because in this model, we said when this is correlated with this contemporaneously, we're inconsistent and we're biased. So this model gives us a biased estimate and an inconsistent estimate of UT hat. Because we have lag y and the lag u, we have unbiased, inconsistent we have biased, inconsistent estimators. And so our estimate of ut hat is wrong, it's biased. So our estimate of this is biased. So our estimate of this is biased. So it's no good. So we use Durbin's H instead. 
Now, to be honest, most of us only do this when we write papers. Durbin's H doesn't get spit out automatically by programs, and it's usually pretty close to Durbin Watson. So most of the time, you kind of end up looking at the Durbin Watson statistic anyway to get a good idea. If it's near two, this is probably going to come out okay. You should check it anyway, but you can get a rough indication of the Durbin Watson statistic. But this is the only way to get a precise answer. So this statistic then is the following. You, you can get it out of the program. You just tell it, I want Durbin's H, and it'll, it'll print it for you. Some of them are smart enough to know when to use it. But H is rho hat times the square root of N, T, we can use a T, over 1 minus T sigma squared beta hat. This is the beta on the y t minus 1 term. So it's, it's this beta 2. But whatever the y t minus 1 term is, this is the standard error of that estimate. And this is distributed. It's really easy. It's normal 0, 1. And this rho hat you can get as um, 1 minus 1 half times the Durbin-Watson statistic. So you, you can get this right off your printout. You've got the Durbin-Watson statistic there. This gives you rho hat. This is the number of observations. And this is a thing beside the yt minus 1 term on the printout, the standard error they used to calculate the t. So this is all just sitting on the printout waiting for you to calculate it. It's real easy to calculate. And it's distributed normal 0, 1. So it's the usual kind of a test. If it's near 0, no problem. If it's out in the tails, you have a problem. So when you have, if this isn't there, Durbin Watson's fine. It's only when we have that lag yt, we get the correlation, we have a problem. OK. One problem, one potential problem is this can be greater than 1. Then you get the square root of a negative number and the test fails. So sometimes this will be greater than 1. You get 1 minus 2, you get minus 1 down here. You get square root of a negative number. You can't do that for a test statistic. And so sometimes this test fails. But most of the time, it should be OK. the notes I want to use. Huh, I don't have them. Oh well, we don't need them. Missing some notes. Wonder where they went. All right. Well, we'll just go to Adam. Um, so now we want to talk about correcting this thing.
All right. We're flying blind. Yes, sir. Oh yeah, you have to take the square root. Okay. My yes. You're exactly right. Okay, so how do we correct for this? <laughs> this is weird. I wonder if I'm going to teach my PhD class this afternoon. I'll have I'll find. Them. So how do you correct? So there's three tests. Durbin Watson's test for first order auto correlation. Durbin's H, when you have a lag Y, so whenever you have lag Y's on the right-hand side, do Durbin's H. And then we have the Bruce Godfrey test for higher order serial correlation, and for when these tests don't work or come out inconclusive. So there's three tests. Okay, we found it. How do we fix it? So YT is beta 1 plus beta 2 x 2t plus ut where ut is rho, ut minus 1 plus et. So that's the model we want to estimate. So, Let's take rho, yt minus 1, is rho beta 1 plus rho beta 2, x2, 2 minus 1, plus rho ut. So all I did was lag the model one period and multiply through by rho. Now we want to subtract one model from the other. Where's the notes I put a paper clip around last night? Mm. So I'll just subtract this from this. This from this. So yt minus rho yt minus 1 equals beta 1 minus rho beta 1 plus beta 2 x 2 t minus rho beta 2 x 2 t minus 1 plus u t minus rho u t minus 1. This is the critical term right here that makes everything work. <coughs> What is ut minus rho ut minus 1? Et. So this is Et. So this transform model, I do a little more algebra, no longer has serial correlated errors. So now my model is yt is rho yt minus 1 plus beta 1 times 1 minus rho x, no, 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 don't write that. Plus beta 1 times 1 minus rho plus beta 2 x 2 t minus rho beta 2 x 2 t minus 1 plus ET. I get all the terms? I think so. Now, because rho appears here, here, and here, the model is nonlinear in the parameters. There's a nonlinear relationship among the parameters. This is a nonlinear model. You can't have a relationship, a, a relationship among your parameters in OLS, especially a nonlinear one like this. So I can't use OLS because the assumption that it's linear in the parameters for Gauss Markov is not satisfied. But I can estimate this with nonlinear 
So what you use is nonlinear least squares. And that will estimate, that will give you the rho hat, beta 1 hat, and beta 2 hat. So I can get estimates of this model using nonlinear least squares, and they will be fully efficient. This is what your what eViews does. It estimates this model right here. And it does it with nonlinear least squares. All you have to do when you're doing Linreg and you put y and you know the, the c and, and whatever your variables are, at the end you just put AR1 from the on the regression statement, and it will correct it using nonlinear least squares. This could be ARP, this could be AR7, this could be AR3, it could be AR whatever and it will correct it for the problem. Yes? Um, well, um, row y, t minus 1, the row u, t should be row u, t minus 1, right? Oh, yes, thank you. Right here. I left the minus 1 off. which is why it's good to bring your notes to class. Now on the back of the page, I don't seem to have. I did this for an AR2 just to show you how it works. So let me do one more of these. How would you show how to estimate a, a model with an AR2 errors? What would it look like? So suppose I have yt is beta 1 plus beta 2 x 2 t plus ut, where ut is row 1, ut minus 1 plus row 2, ut minus 2 plus et. But what you need to do, the clue is right here, I need to get et as my error. So I need to get ut minus row 1, ut minus 2, minus row 2, t minus 2. So I do what I did here, but I'll have a third term, right? You write yt equals row 1, yt minus 1 equals row 2, yt minus 2 equals. Then you subtract these two from this one. This error will be plus ut. This will be plus row 1, ut minus 1. And this will be plus row 2, ut minus 2. So when I subtract, the second two from the first one, what's my error going to be here? ut minus rho, ut minus 1 minus rho, ut minus 2 equals et. We get the error that we want from this. So we just subtract. You'll do this one more time. So you'll end up, it'll be, uh, you'll have rho 1, yt minus 1, rho 2, my t, this will be rho 1 minus rho 2. And you'll have a second set of terms here uh, that are lagged. I, sh I should just write it out. So in this case, you'll have you don't actually have to do any of this. I just want to try to show you how it works. So in this case, these would all be row ones. Then you'd have row two yt minus 2 equals rho 2 beta 1 plus rho 2 beta 2 x 2 t minus 2 plus rho 2 ut minus 2. So then you subtract, and your model is yt is rho 1 yt minus 1 plus rho 2 yt minus 2 plus beta 1, 1 minus rho 1 minus rho 2 plus, let me slow down, plus beta 2 x 2t minus rho 1 beta 2 x 2 t minus 1 minus rho 2 beta 2 x 2 t minus 2 plus ut minus rho 1 ut minus 1 minus rho 2 
e to the minus 2. And this whole term here is, is our e t. I think I got all the terms. I didn't actually look at it. I was doing it in my head. Did I get them right? I think it's right. It's hard to see the board from here, so you just kind of have to do it in your head. So now you'd estimate this model, and again, it's just totally nonlinear because you have rows appearing in a bunch of different places, and so it's not linear in the parameters. But you can use nonlinear least squares to estimate this. Now you just make that a two quick estimate y c x two a r two. You'd be done with this model. That's all you would have to do. As long as that's not a lag y. This is called quasi differencing. So you're estimating the quasi differenced model. y t minus y, no, I'm not going to ask you about this. That's called differencing. y t minus rho, y t minus 1 is quasi-differencing. So this is a quasi-differenced model, as it's called. OK, bigger picture. When we ran into the heteroscedasticity problem, our solution was to find a way to transform the data so that we isolate an error that is no longer heteroscedasticity. And so we divide it by the thing causing, we divide it by the standard error to get rid of the heteroscedasticity. We transformed our data in some way. Essentially, we're doing the same thing here. We're finding a way to take the original model, transform it into something else where the error is no longer a problem. Now, in this particular case, we actually get rid of one problem, and we induce another. We get rid of <coughs> serial correlation, and we induce nonlinear parameters. So we fix one of the C parameters, and to answer your question, I have no idea which of the C's is that the X, the parameters are linear. So I, I won't ask you that. But one of the C assumptions is that it's linear, the parameters. But that second, that's an easy problem to fix. We just do nonlinear least squares. So we take a problem that's sort of hard to fix, transform the model into a model we know how to fix, that has the right kind of errors, and then we estimate that. So this is what you do. See, let me, let's go back to the simple case. Beta 1 plus beta 2 x 2t plus ut, ut is rho, ut minus 1 plus bt. Suppose rho is known. It's never known. But let's just suppose it is. Remember with heteroscedasticity, when we knew sigma was really easy to fix? Same thing's true here. If I know what rho is, all the nonlinearity here is all about figuring out what the dang rows are. If I know what rho is, I can get an easy answer to this problem. What I would do is form a variable, yt minus rho 1, yt minus 1. I'd call that yt star. So I know this. So I can do this in a spreadsheet. yt minus 0.736 times the one below it on the spreadsheet. So B1 is A1 minus 0.7 A2. No, it would be A0. <laughs> Sorry. And so on. So you can do this in the spreadsheet. Then you take X2T minus rho X2T minus 1, and you'd call that X star, X2 star. You could do that in your spreadsheet, too. And so what you end up estimating is yt minus rho yt minus 1 equals 
beta 1 times 1 minus rho plus beta 2 times x2t minus rho x2 t minus 1 plus bt. If you look at the very first case I did for an AR1, if you group terms together, you can get this. If I know rho, I can calculate this as y star. I can change my constant from 1 to 1 minus rho. I just add another variable that's all 1 minus rho, and I estimate it without a constant. So I, I can form that variable. And I can form this variable. This is x2 star. So basically, you just estimate y star is beta 1 star plus beta 2 x2 star plus et. Because this, this error is ut minus rho, ut minus 1. But that's et. We know what that is. So we know rho. And so in this case, you could just estimate this model directly without nonlinear least squares. You wouldn't have any trouble because ET doesn't have any serial correlation. So if you know rho, it's easy to find the transformation that fixes the problem. You just subtract off rho times the observation before. You just take yesterday's. This was just model one. I just subtracted rho one, yt minus one from, from yt minus one. And you get this model. So if we knew rho, we could just form this data, form this, form this, Estimate this model. This would actually be times 1 minus rho. Estimate this, and we have, un we have blue estimates. But our problem is we don't know what rho is. And since we don't know what rho is, we have to estimate it. And the estimation of rho turns it into a nonlinear problem. So once we introduce that rho is unknown, then we have to go to this nonlinear least squares solution. Hmm. I just don't like the looks I'm seeing. I don't like the silence. It feels like, oh my. I got lost a while ago. <laughs> Earlier you showed us like graphically what uh, autocorrelation looks like. Can you show us like what, how it graphically it changes when you fix it? Yes. If you look at the transform model, it will have a different intercept, but the same slope. You have to adjust the intercept. To get back here, I have to divide this by 1 minus rho to get the actual intercept. So the true model is here. This model has an intercept that's a little bit lower by 1 minus rho, unless rho is negative, then it's a little bit bigger. But generally for us, it'll be a little bit lower. But it has exactly the same slope as the true model. And in this case, our errors come in waves. In this case, our error pattern is completely random. So we've transformed the model in a way that, this isn't the same model, because that's y and x. But, but you get the same slope and a different intercept from the original model. But because your errors are now random, these are ETs and these are UTs, you don't have a problem anymore with serial correlation. So when rho is known, I would take rho yt minus 1 is beta 1 rho plus beta 2 rho x2t plus rho u t minus 1. This multiplied through by rho. Then I subtract y t minus rho y t minus 1 is beta 1 times 1 minus rho plus beta 2 times x2 t minus rho x2 t minus 1 plus u t minus rho u t minus 1. And this is e t. So if I know what rho is, it's very simple. If this is 0.7, I just form y star, b1 star plus b2 x2 star plus et. And then I estimate this model. So it would be very simple if we knew rho. But we don't know rho, 
So now we have to move this to the other side and estimate this as a nonlinear least squares problem. And that's a whole lot harder. And so all the problem comes from the fact that we don't know what row is. Let's didn't go as well as I hoped. We have a little tiny bit left on um, this section. Then I'll go on to a new chapter. Let me ask you to do something over the weekend. We got a test coming up. All right, good. Um, I it was not the test. I just kind of wanted to build up the format. Uh, it'll be. Um, I've got old ones up. So okay. in the sidebar, click on midterm. Okay. It'll be just like those. Mm -hmm. I'll say more about it on Tuesday. I'll click on review. You'll get last year's review. It'll be identical. Okay. It'll, it'll go right up through chapter 12. The only thing I haven't covered is something called arch models, which is very simple. We'll do next time. What I want you to do over the weekend, is it Thursday? Yeah. Is um, figure out what you don't know, and I'll take as much time as I need on Tuesday to straighten out the things you don't know about this or anything else. I will not go on to the next chapter until you have exhausted your questions. I do want to get through arch first, but I need you to help me. And so come back Tuesday, and we'll take the time we need to straighten out what isn't straight today. Hopefully. I'll do my best, I promise you.